It is always a joy to be here and to fellowship with R.C., whom I love and appreciate, and with the others who are part of uh, Ligonier Ministries and C. Friends, and, uh, and particularly to uh, be with you. I do feel like the poor. You always have me with you. And that's okay. If it's okay with you, it's certainly fine with me. And I, th I think I understand my subject. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I think I understand my subject on the myth of influence. Uh, you, you'll be a better judge of that, or somebody will when I'm finished, than, than you will be able to be now. I think I understand uh, what was in the mind of the people who crafted that subject, having read through the edition of Table Talks in which that was addressed. Uh, but at the same time, I, I, I'm going to come at it from, from my own heart and my own perspective and hope that it will prove to be helpful to you. You know, when I came out of seminary, I knew there would be battles to be fought, and, uh, and my dad was, uh, and still is, a, a warrior for the truth, and I think I uh, inherited that from his example in, in the pattern of his life and ministry, and, and I really thought there would, be, there would be battles to fight. There would be um, battles over inerrancy. There would be battles over the authority of the Word of God. There would be battles over the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, which was under liberal assault. I could already anticipate uh, battles over spiritual um, areas such as the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, paradigms for sanctification, those kinds of things. I expected that. What I didn't expect was to spend most of my ministry life battling to rescue the gospel from evangelicals. That really has been a shock to me. And it's seemingly getting worse all the time as the gospel sinks below the radar. And if you'll uh, pardon me, I think it, it is going to be in my heart and through this message to call us back to a true understanding of the gospel. Let me just see if I can't start out with a point and then we'll, we'll go from there to see how that fleshes out in a particular text. The myth of influence is that the gospel advances on the back of public favor. The myth of influence is that we can somehow influence people into the kingdom of God if we can create a pop gospel, a designer gospel, if we can create alliances, if we can posture ourselves and position ourselves in places of influence and authority and impact in the world around us, if we can stylize our churches to eliminate consumer resistance, we can sort of influence people into the kingdom. That's the scheme. And a myriad of compromises are made in that process. And you know them. I don't need to chronicle all of the compromises in developing a non-threatening message, an inclusive kind of salvation, in trying to eliminate everybody's offenses, making the church uh, look, sound, feel like a big Starbucks, uh, trying to craft all kinds of things to, to make people feel comfortable and all offensive elements being set aside, we can sort of subtly lure people into the kingdom. There's only one way into the kingdom, and it is through the gate of the gospel and the gospel alone. And the cruel irony is that after everybody has done all of that and created all those machinations and all those marketing things, at the end of the day, people will only enter the kingdom when they understand and believe the true gospel, the word of the cross, is revealed in Scripture. The gospel does not advance on the back of public favor. It advances on the back of the Holy Spirit in spite of public hostility. The myth of influence is sort of if they think we're cool, they'll think Jesus is cool too. Serious worship disappears along with the public ordinances. Biblical theological exposition of Scripture vanishes. Transcendence and profundity are exchanged for mimicking shallow worldly styles. Church discipline is non-existence, holiness minimized, and sin normalized. And the myth is that somehow this is going to get people into the kingdom. Now, I want to get people into the kingdom. I understand what was in the heart of John Knox when he said, Give me Scotland or I die. I understand what Henry Martin meant when he walked out of that terrible Hindu temple 
in India and weeping wrote in his diary, I cannot endure existence if Jesus is to be so dishonored. I understand that. I want to see the world change. I want to see society change. I want to see righteousness prevail. But the only way that can be change is through the power of the gospel. And we have to go back to that gospel. And the good news, frankly, no matter how you sugarcoat it, is scandalous. It is offensive, it is shameful, and it is hard to believe. In fact, that's the title of a book I'm in the process of writing, Hard to Believe. Very hard to believe. To believe the gospel goes against everything that is natural in man, everything. And that's why the word of the cross is so shameful, so shameful, so antagonizing, that even faithful Christians struggle to proclaim the true gospel because of the rejection, the ridicule, and the embarrassment it brings. I think many people alter the gospel not to make it easier for people to believe, but they alter the gospel to take the heat off themselves for presenting it. Martin Lloyd-Jones once said, if you have never been ashamed of the gospel in your life, it's not because you're such a great Christian, it's because you don't understand the gospel. It produces hostility. That's why it's hard for some Christian leaders when they get on television in certain secular settings to really speak the gospel. Sometimes they can't get the word Jesus out. It just won't come out. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.8, do not be ashamed of the Lord. What a bizarre statement to make to a preacher. Do not be ashamed of the Lord. But you see, the gospel is so hard to believe that the sinner who should feel the shame turns the shame on the preacher, on the evangel. Paul said, Romans 1, 16, for I am not, what? Ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That just didn't drop out of the air. He didn't just say that without a context. Why did he say that? I mean, would a person, for example, who found the cure for AIDS say, um, boy, I, I'm, I just have to overcome shame to proclaim this. I, would a person who found the cure for cancer somehow have to overcome shame to present that cure? Why is it then when we have the cure for sin in the truth of the gospel, there is shame associated with it, shame that silences us, shame that makes us literally twist the gospel into something easy, something acceptable, something that produces no hostility. It's always been that way. And Paul had, by the power of the Holy Spirit, come to a place in his life where he said, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I will not be ashamed. And he said that in a context of a culture where shame and honor were critical matters. Shame and honor in the ancient Greek and Roman world were preeminent. Homer wrote this, the chief good is to be well spoken of, the chief evil is to be badly spoken of by one society. Avoid shame and seek honor. Paul preached in that shame-sensitive culture, shamelessly proclaiming what people thought was a shameful message about a shamed man. It was foolish, it was scandalous, it was offensive, it was shameful. But it was the only way that sinners could come into the kingdom. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to take you to a familiar passage. As R.C. said a moment ago, we go back to some of these passages we know so well. This is one of those, but I, I want to look at this passage both this morning and tomorrow morning. I couldn't get this into one message, and frankly, I don't know if I can get it into two, 
but we'll go as far as we can. I want you to, t- to look at chapter 1 and listen to the Word of God starting in verse 18. For the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. I'm going to stop there for a moment. There's the key verse, the key half of a verse. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. God determined that entrance into His kingdom and salvation would come by means of this message, which is called in verse 18, the word of the cross, which is the power of God to those who are being saved. Now, what I want to do is look at this passage this morning and tomorrow morning, and I want to show you the shameful gospel of the cross and why it is that all the posturing and all of the religious alliances and all of the positions of power and influence in, in our world that might be available to Christians don't take us any place where ultimately, where ultimately we can do any eternal good until wherever we are, the gospel is proclaimed, and there is no way to lessen the shame and the scandal of that message. Now, I want to just unfold a few things. First of all, the shameful stigma of the cross. And I I don't know everything I'm going to say, so this is kind of an adventure for me too. The shameful stigma of the cross. But I want you to notice, first of all, verse 18, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. Then drop down to verses 22 and 23. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. Go back to verse 18. The word of the cross, the message of the cross, the gospel, is to those who are perishing moria in the Greek, idiotic, insane, It's the word from which we get moron. And it's a repeated article there. The word of the cross turns that second article into a demonstrative pronoun. The word of the cross, the only cross, is to those who are apoluminois, those who are lost, those who are ruined, those who are unregenerate. It is moronic. It is idiotic. I don't know that we fully understand that. If God wanted to design a message that was going to be hard to believe, He could not have designed one more difficult than this one. Because the idea of God dying on a cross was moronic, both to a Jew and a Gentile. The Jews, according to verse 22, sought a sign, some wonder, some supernatural evidence that this was the true Messiah and this was the true Savior. They sought a sign, and God gave them a stumbling block. And the Greeks sought wisdom, some transcendental, elevated, esoteric knowledge, some elevated spiritual experience. They wanted wisdom, they got foolishness. The Jews wanted a sign, they got a stumbling block. The Jews received a scandal on. A crucified Messiah was bizarre, offensive, and blasphemous. And the Greeks who loved wisdom saw this as utter stupidity, the nonsense of the eternal creator force of the universe crucified on a cross as idiotic. Let me give you a little background to the cross so you understand why this was true. 
Crucifixion was a horrific form of capital punishment, its origin in the Persian Empire, used by various barbarian groups, used for individuals and group executions. It came down, of course, into the Roman Empire and right into the land of Israel, as we know. But going back a little bit in its history, Darius crucified 3,000 Babylonians. Alexander the Great crucified 2,000 from Tyre along the shore. You know, the people of Tyre really irritated him because after he conquered them and they escaped to the island offshore, he sent out a message that he wanted supplies, and they basically said to him, well, you can't get to us. We're in this island, and we're not giving you anything. So he took all the rubble of the city on the shore. He destroyed, threw it in the water, made a causeway, and went out there and massacred them and crucified 2,000 of them. Alexander Janius, who lived in the area right around 100 B.C., crucified 800 Pharisees while their wives and children were slaughtered at their feet while they were hanging on a cross. This seared the horror of crucifixion in the Jewish minds. Rome came to power around 63 B.C. and used crucifixion extensively. Felix familiar name, procurator of Judea, A.D. 52 to 58, crucified many, many criminals. And when Titus destroyed Jerusalem in 70 A.D., there were mass crucifixions everywhere. In fact, there were so many crucifixions in 70 A.D. that the soldiers ran out of wood. Constantine finally in 337 or so abolished crucifixion after a millennium of unbelievable cruelty. Now, a survey like that indicates to us that crucifixion was common. The way the Lord died was nothing notable. Some historians estimate that around the time of Jesus, at least 30,000 people are on record as have, having been crucified. The question then comes up, how could this Jesus be anybody exceptional? Certainly dying on a cross is not exceptional. How in the world could we assume that he is God incarnate when he died not only a common death, but the common death of the most base kind of criminal? Roman citizens, for example, were generally exempt from crucifixion. The only way a Roman citizen could ever get himself crucified was if he committed treason against Rome. cross was reserved for rebellious slaves. It was reserved for conquered people. It was used for notorious robbers and assassins. It was occasionally used for those Roman citizens who had breached in severe ways, treasonously, the security of Rome. The Roman Empire policies on crucifixion led Romans to view crucified men with universal contempt. Anybody who was crucified was treated with absolute contempt. Crucifixion was a systematized series of events, including, including flogging, carrying the cross, beam, a sign over your neck, naked, and of course then tied or nailed to the crossbar, hoisted to an upright post, and left there suspended, stark naked before the view of everyone. Death could be hurried by shattering the legs, but was usually prolonged by not doing that so that the sufferer suffered for days. The final indignity was leaving the corpse to rot and be carrion for the birds. Josephus describes multiple tortures and positions of Christians during the siege of Jerusalem. They were crucified in every imaginable kind of position, even impaled in unmentionable ways. The Gentiles viewed anybody crucified with absolute contempt. Crucifixion was a virtual obscenity, not to be discussed in polite company. The cultured world did not talk about crucifixion. Cicero wrote, this very word, cross, should be removed not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. The deep contempt that Gentiles had for those crucified is seen in pagan statements against Christ. We were in Rome recently and in the Palatine Hill near Circus Maximus. There was discovered there graffiti scratched on a stone in a guard room, and it shows the figure of a man with the head of an ass, and this man is hanging on a cross, 
And below this crucified figure, in a gesture of adoration, is another man bowing before this man with the head of an ass. And the inscription reads, Alexamenos worships his God. Just sheer mockery. Such a depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ, so repulsive to believers, vividly illustrates the pagan contempt for the idea of a crucified Lord and God. Justin's first apology in AD 52 summarizes the Gentile view, quote, they proclaim our madness to consist in this, that we give to a crucified man a place equal to the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of all. That is the summation of Christian madness, nonsense, idiocy. And the Jewish attitude toward crucifixion was all of that and more. They detested the Roman practice, holding it in more contempt than the pagans did, but they went beyond that. They saw a crucified person as one who bore the curse of God. Deuteronomy 21, 23, whoever hangs on a tree is cursed by God. Dying a common death, dying the death of the most wretched criminals, dying a death bearing the curse of God, and you're telling me this is God, the Son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world? That is scandalous. Scandalous. The Jews did not, crucified, did not crucify living people, but they did hang up dead bodies. Second century Mishal indicates that blasphemers and idolaters, after they died, were put up on a cross. After they were stoned, were put up on a cross and taken down the same day to fulfill Deuteronomy 21:23, showing their curse from God. Now, where am I going with all this? These pervasive attitudes toward crucifixion posed a massive obstacle to the gospel of the first century. When we think of a cross, we think of something pretty that hangs in a church or around your neck. It was scurrilous and scandalous, a stumbling block, foolishness, idiocy. I'm telling you, preach that message in that first century world, and it's hard to believe. And there really is no way to make it easy. It's hard to believe. The gospel actually called the Jews to surrender to the very one they considered smitten by God and afflicted, to borrow Isaiah's words. Well, it doesn't seem to me that God could have put a more formidable barrier to faith in their way. Some Gentile writers said of the cross, it is a perverse and extravagant superstition. Others said it is a sick delusion. Martin Hengel has written an excellent little book called Crucifixion. You should get it and read it. It says, to believe that the one preexistent Son of the one true God, the mediator at creation and the redeemer of the world, had appeared in very recent times in out-of-the-way Galilee as a member of the obscure people of the Jews, and even worse, had died the death of a common criminal on a cross, could only be regarded as a sign of madness. The real gods of Greece and Rome could be distinguished from mortal men by the very fact that they were immortal. They had absolutely nothing in common with the one who was bound in the most ignominious fashion, executed in the most shameful way. But this is the story. This is the truth. This is the cross. There's no seeker-friendly message here. There's nothing easy to believe here. It is both an absurdity and an obscenity. There is not only the shameful stigma of the cross, but secondly, let me talk a minute about the shameful simplicity of the cross. Go back to the text. In verses 19 to 21, the, the apostle writes, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? 
Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Jews and Gentiles were into complexity. Especially the Greeks were into their philosophical complexities, and the Jews were into their rabbinic complexities. The, the Gentiles loved philosophy, they loved metaphysics, they loved mental gymnastics, they loved intellectual labyrinths. And they believed the truth was knowable only to those who had ascended knowledge, only to those who had elevated insights, only to those who, who uh, transcended the hoi polloi. They were looking for the complexities of transcendental knowledge. That was embedded in their system of life. After I was on Larry King the other night, and a very famous person called me, wanted to talk with me on the phone, and he said, I'm searching for religious answers. And uh, he said, um, I want to ask a question about your church. And I said, sure. He said, does your church understand the spiritual significance of gravity. I said, I don't think we do. <laughs> maybe, maybe you could help me to understand this. I know that if you get up high enough, it has real spiritual significance. And then he went on to say, well, so are, you don't understand the multi-layered magnetic fields of the universe that re reverberate against each other? No, I'm not real sure about that. But I said, I'd love to talk with you, so next Wednesday I have an appointment. Pray for me. I don't even know what he's going to throw at me, but I know what I'm going to tell him. <laughs> and it's not going to be easy. It's hard to believe, especially if you're there in that esoteric never-never land. The gospel has no sensitivity to that. It has no sensitivity and no interest in Gnosticism. It has no interest in what he's into, Kabbalism. It has no interest in the complex, esoteric human wisdom and insight. And it is just offensive. Look what it says. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. It's just too simple. I will destroy the cleverness of the clever, set it aside. And then these mocking statements, where are you, wise man? Where are you, scribe? Where are you, debater of this age? Everything you have to offer is foolishness. All your stuff is, in the same word again from Morino, all your stuff is nonsense. You think the gospel's nonsense. Everything you've got is nonsense. This is a... This is a comprehensive denunciation of all the accumulated insight, understanding, and wisdom of the elite as regards any impact on true spiritual knowledge. Take all the human geniuses, get the best thinkers and the best debaters, and they all add up to absolutely nothing. Nothing. So what are you saying to somebody when you go to them with the gospel? First of all, the gospel runs against the grain of their emotional sensibilities. The horror of crucifixion just doesn't equate with the message that this is God the Son, Lord of the universe. It's more than their emotion could stand, particularly in the first century when it was so vivid. Then when, you, when you've sort of assaulted their emotions, we could say more about that, but keep moving for time, then you go after their mind, and you say, well, by the way, all the wisdom you've accumulated, all your insights and the insights of others through all the centuries amount to absolutely nothing. All spiritual truth is bound up in one reality, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. There were, around the time of Paul, as best we can count, about 50 philosophical parties and movements in the first century. Love of wisdom was their passion. Professing themselves to be wise, they actually had become what? Fools. Human wisdom all set aside. 
in spiritual matters and eternal matters and matters that relate to the kingdom of God has absolutely no contribution to make. And in the wisdom of God, verse 21 says, this wasn't some concession, but in the wisdom of God, He planned it this way that through human wisdom, no one would come to know Him. No one. Jeremiah said, the wise men are put to shame. They are dismayed and caught. They have rejected the word of the Lord. So what kind of wisdom do they have? And so the gospel comes, so hard to believe. It just collides with your emotional sensibilities. It collides with your intellectual pride. It basically says, I don't care what you feel about a crucified person being the Lord of the universe. I don't really care what you think about truth. In fact, the truth is hidden from the wise and revealed to the infants. The cross is so shameful. It's shameful stigma. It's shameful simplicity. A third point, and you can fill in a lot on these as well, it's shameful singularity. It's shameful singularity. Now remember, what we're seeing here is in the end, no matter how we posture ourselves politically, academically, socially, economically, athletically, theatrically, to get in positions of influence, sooner or later, the only way anybody gets into the kingdom is through the gospel. And this is what we have to preach, what we must preach, and it is what God uses. It's not the wise men, the intellectuals, the elite lawyers, writers, philosophers who bring anything redeeming to the world of humanity whatsoever. It is those of us who proclaim the simplicity of the cross just one way. And that leads us to that third point, the singularity of the cross. And you feel that in this text in verse 18. It, the, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And verse 21, again, he says uh, the same thing at the end there. God saves those who believe through the foolishness of this message. And then verse 23, we preach Christ crucified. And it may be to the Jews a stumbling block and Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So take the weakness of God, the gospel, which men deem foolish, and it is more powerful than all the foolishness of men. So here you come to this singular message. And I know that we all believe and affirm that. Let me just make a couple of comments about it and then go to another text for a minute. Here we come at this sinner with a straightforward message. And the message is there's only one Savior, that's all. There's only one truth, that's all. In our postmodern time, that's hard to believe. I'm thinking about that program the other night with Larry King. I was sitting next to that Catholic priest, and off camera, about three times, Larry said to him, now, do you believe that your religion is true? Oh, yes. Well, then, if you believe yours is true, then all of those who say something other than what you say must be wrong. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and he would say, he would say, that's inconsistent. You can't say that yours is true and everybody else's is true when they say something different. He said that about three times off camera. And all the answer, oh, the Jesus I know, he just wants unity. And it was just like you couldn't get there from where he was. You, there was no connect. It was, it was like he was in outer space. I mean, we all know, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's no salvation in any other. We all understand that. But let's go a little deeper, okay? We would agree there's only one way to be saved, although that's not necessarily what all of the evangelicals are saying today. You can be saved without the gospel. You can be saved without the Bible. You can be saved without even knowing who the true God is, ever hearing the name of Jesus. Well, what does it really mean? When you, if you're going to come down to the real singularity of the gospel, what, where does that take you? I want you to turn in your Bible to just a very important passage, um, Luke 9. 
I mean, let's, let's get it in perspective here. We all understand it's Jesus, it's his gospel, death, resurrection, etc. But what are the terms by which one embraces that? Luke 9.23. Jesus was saying to them all, this is this sort of spectrum of people called mathetes, learners, disciples of Jesus, who are everywhere on the spectrum. But he was saying to them, here, here is sort of the, here is the point of clarification. If anyone wishes to come after me, okay, you want to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The cross assaults your emotional sensibilities. Then the cross collides with your intellectual pride, and then it crushes your self-determining will. You want to be a Christian, do you? It's the end of you. You're done. Try to sell that. This is not, listen, this is not the gospel of self-fulfillment. This is the gospel of self-denial. It's not, it's not about you becoming all you can. This isn't the army. This is about the end of you. The, the statement here, really very, um, very important. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself. Arnesos, though, is a verb, a Greek verb used to deny oneself. It's a very strong word. It means to disown or to refuse association with. You want to come to me? Refuse any further association with yourself. That's what it's saying. Literally disown yourself. This isn't about tweaking your life to make you more successful or to help you hit home, more home runs. This is about the end of you. This is about, woe is me for I am undone, Isaiah 6, right? This is the beatitude attitude. Blessed are the bankrupt in spirit, mourning over their sin, meek over their condition, starved spiritually and hungering for a righteousness they don't have. This is Philippians 3. This is Paul saying, I spend my whole life up till now accumulating all this stuff in the gain column. You know, I'm of the nation Israel. Points. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Points. I'm racking them up. A Hebrew of the Hebrews, kosher to the core. Zealous for the law. Blameless in terms of the public. And he said, it was all gain to me until I saw Christ, and then it was all manure. This is total desire to disconnect from what you are. That is the attitude of the penitent. It's Luke 18 where you don't lift your eyes. You just look down and pound your breasts and cry out for God to be merciful to such a wretched sinner. That's the man who goes home justified. This isn't about self-fulfillment. This is about self-suicide. Let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up, that to be low is to be high, that the broken heart is the healed heart, that the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit, that the repenting soul is the triumphant soul, that to have nothing is to possess everything, that to bear the cross is to wear the crown, that to give up everything is to receive all. It's the prayer, Lord, let me find your light in my darkness, your joy in my sorrow, your grace in my sin, your riches in my poverty, your glory in my humiliation, your life in my death. That's a hard thing to accept. 
The cross crashes into my emotional sensibilities. It crashes into my intellectual pride and wipes away all human wisdom. And then it assaults my self-determining will and all my plans and dreams and schemes and hopes and ambitions. It obliterates them and says, fall down at my feet and deny yourself. And not only that, to the degree that you take up your cross every day. Now, please, that is not some mystical spiritual statement. It's not talking about ascending to the second level of spirituality or the deeper life. Jesus was not a Keswick teacher. What is he saying here? They knew what a cross was. I just explained what they would. You say to somebody, take up your cross, whoa. What, are, what, are you, what is Jesus saying? Self-denial to the point of martyrdom, if that's what I ask. You mean to tell me you, you, just, you, you just don't want to, you know, give me something to fix my life. What you want me to do is give you all my life. Now you're getting it. Now you're getting it. And you're going to do this every day. Paul said, I die daily. Every day I wake up, I know it could be the last day I live. He wasn't speaking about some mystical thing. Every day he woke up, he knew one of the plots of the Jews or the Gentiles that had been hatched in their minds could have come to fruition. Every day he, he probably went through his own funeral thousands of times, anticipating death. As a way of life, you're willing to die. So next time you give the gospel to somebody, give them the same message Jesus gave them. And if they turn away like the rich young ruler, then they aren't desperate enough, right? It's hard to believe. It's hard to believe. Verses 24 and 25, Luke 9, whoever wishes to save his life shall what? It doesn't mean you, it doesn't, it doesn't mean you give away a little of it. You abandon it. You want in the kingdom, it's the end of you. It's over. You're done. You're history. The story's over. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he's the one who will save it. And how much is that worth? What's it profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Or as it says in the other gospel, his own soul. Luther understood this. You know, I, I just continue to be amazed at what he understood. Luther in 1517 put his 95 theses on the door of the church and the fourth of his protesting assertions may have escaped you or you've forgotten it. The fourth of his protesting assertions was that a penitent heart is characterized by self-hatred. Here's a quote. So penance remains while self-hate remains. Namely, right up to the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You know, you're gonna, if you're coming into the kingdom, you're coming in with an attitude that says, I don't ever want to be associated with me anymore. And even when you're saved, you're going to have a measure of that same self-hate so that you understand exactly what Paul meant when he said, Oh, wretched man that I... What's the next word? Am. And when I think about heaven, I don't think about, oh, wow, streets of gold, pearl, big pearl. Uh, that, that's nice. I think about getting rid of the wretchedness. This is about self-hate. So you want to be a Christian, do you? It's hard. It goes against your natural inclinations. It goes against your natural emotions. It goes against your natural intellect. It goes against your natural will. Self-suicide is the polar opposite of the feel-good message, isn't it? Come to Jesus and you get all you want. What is that? Um, to just, you say, well, isn't this an isolated verse here? Are you sure this is, there's some balance? Well, let me show you some other ones. One would be enough for me. This is, after all, the Word of God. How many times does he have to say it before we get it? But Matthew 10, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. 
I came to set a man against his father and daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has found his life shall lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. Part of self-denial means the denial of those relationships which are most precious to you. How desperately do you want to come into the kingdom of God? How desperately do you want eternal life? How desperately do you want forgiveness? Do you want it enough to deny the relationships that are most natural and most precious? Now this thing is assaulting my emotions, it's assaulting my mind, it's assaulting my will, and it's assaulting my relationships. And it could even attack your economics. In Mark chapter 10, just to touch base with what I commented on a minute ago, the rich young ruler, you know the story, well you can read it in Matthew 19 as well. Jesus said uh, to the young man, so you want eternal life? Well, let's talk about something else before we talk about that. Let's talk about sin. And of course he wouldn't admit that he sinned. All these commandments I've kept from my youth. And then, of course, Jesus followed it up by saying, well, let's talk about authority. Let's talk about who's in charge. Let's talk about self-denial. Take all your money and give it to the poor. Hmm. He, would not, he would not deny his self-righteousness, and he would not deny his possessions. And he went away as lost as when he showed up, even though he asked the right question. It's in Luke 9 and verse 57, very familiar portion. This man comes along and says to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, well, I'm not going to the Ritz-Carlton. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. (laughs) This doesn't sound too good. I'm really interested, and I would like to follow you. Well, you got to know, you're going to have to sacrifice a comfortable place to live, and I don't have anything to offer you of material things. And and he said to another, follow me. He said, "Um, permit me to first go and bury my father. Why did he say that? His father wasn't dead. Why did he say that? He just heard the prior conversation. Let me go home and I'll wait till my dad dies and leaves me the inheritance. Then I'll come and follow you. After all, you just said you don't have any money. And he said to to him, uh, allow the dead to bury their own dead. As for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. You've got to leave all that behind. Inheritances, parents, family. And another one said, I'll follow you, Lord, but, but, but I need to go home and say goodbye, you know. And you know what, that goodbye would be a, a goodbye. And, you know, he doesn't have any money. Could you, you know, give me a little? And by the time he's said goodbye to everybody in the extended family, he's, he's ready. He's loaded. Jesus said, you do that and you're not fit for the kingdom of God. It's about self-denial. This is not the gospel that gives you all you want in this world. This is the gospel that takes everything you are and everything you have. And then the Lord gives you back what He deems appropriate. In fact, John 12, 25, Jesus said, He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. He who hates his life. This is not easy. It's a narrow gate, Matthew 7. It's a narrow gate. It's hard to find. Few there be that find it. Luke 12, Luke 13, this is so significant a statement. Luke 13, 24 and 25. Strive to enter by the narrow door. Strive, agonize. It's not easy. Agonize. Then this amazing statement, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. It's so hard that you can't find it. If you find it, you can't get through it. 
What in the world? Why is it so hard? I would think living in evangelical uh, climate in America that becoming a Christian is easy. No, it's not easy. It's hard. How hard? Impossible. Did you know I was going there? It's impossible. I mean, this is just massacring everything there is about us. And, and when you look at evangelicalism, what are they doing? They're trying to create something that appeals to the emotion, the mind, the will, the relationships of people so they can hold on to all of that stuff and still come into the kingdom and somehow we'll influence them in. No, the only way into the kingdom, forget the influence. Nobody gets saved by influence. They get saved by the gospel, and this is the gospel. And the gospel is a gospel of self-denial. These... The message is clear. Why is it so hard? Why, why do many seek to enter and they can't? Because self-denial is so hard. Because self is all the sinner knows and all the sinner loves. You say, well, this could, this could discourage a personal evangelism. Well, this is, this is Friday, Saturday's tomorrow. If you're not here tomorrow to hear the rest of this, God have mercy on your sin-sick, shriveled-up soul because I'm going somewhere, but I'm not there. Let me, let me just close with this. Matthew 13, a man sees a treasure in a field. Jesus said he sells everything to buy it. Man sees a pearl of great price, sells everything to buy it. That's what we're talking about. The singularity of the gospel, not only is it about Christ and Christ alone, and we know that, not only is it that exclusive gospel, there is no salvation in any other, no salvation apart from Christ. Not only is it that exclusive gospel, but it is the singularity of this utter and total self-denial and submission to the Christ of that gospel. It's a shameful message. It just assaults the natural man. Shameful stigma, shameful simplicity, shameful singularity. And uh, the rest I'll leave till tomorrow. You're going to like where we end up. We're going to end up in the great doctrine of election. <laughs> Pray with me. Father, we thank you for your wonderful, powerful word. And we just are so blessed to have the privilege of being in this great conference and being exposed to those gifted and faithful men of God who proclaim Your Word. And we do pray, Lord, that we might understand uh, what Doug Wilson said in the last session, that Your theology comes at Your fingertips, that the truth that we really believe shows up in how we live. We pray, O oh God, that You will take the truth of this gospel and may we not only believe it so that we live lives of utter submission to Christ, but having believed it in our own lives, may we be faithful to proclaim it in this way that others may come to this place of impossibility and see the mighty hand of God, draw them through their natural resistance into the glorious light of the gospel of Christ. And we ask that you would bless us to that end, that the kingdom may advance as we faithfully proclaim the truth. In Christ's name, amen.